Welcome to Cracking the Code. This is Ryan Skinner. And today I have a pretty special guest. Um, as most of you know, I'm in recovery. And in recovery, you meet all kinds of people. You meet people who are sane. You meet people who are insane. You meet people who do things that humans and Navy SEALs aren't even meant to do. And um, that's what Bobby comes with. But Bob, first, let's get a little backstory. Um, you got to qualify. How did you get into recovery? What was your issues? Oh, I'm the youngest of five. Um, I was a people pleaser and a follower to my brothers. What they did, I did. And what my father did, I did. And I never knew they might be wrong, you know. And in a lot of the stuff that was, our house was full of people partying, drinking, like there were no such rules. And um, that's how I started off. And, you know, it, it seems like sixth grade, I would follow my brothers and do, you know, they'd babysit and I'd be out drinking with them and whatever, you know. So uh, it just, I was a hockey player and, and, you know, Melrose, I grew up in Melrose, I played hockey and blah, blah, blah with all the, all the guys, Andy Brickley and people like that. But um, I hit seventh grade and within two weeks, I found what I'm gonna do with life. And it was, um, I was in the hallway. I remember like it was yesterday. This pretty girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. And I set my eyes on her and the skates went under the bed, the little matchbox cars and whatever I did and everything was gone. I stuck to her. Thank God she was awesome. Comes from a very big family. She's actually my wife today. Yeah, that. she's a saint. She is a saint. Oh, man. But, um, you know, I, I, I didn't know it at the time. But, um, you know, and back then, seventh grade, we had an adult relationship. We were doing all kinds of drugs. We were staying out all night. We, you know, we were just, we were kids just with no rules, you know. And uh, we followed, our, our, you know, she had come from 11. Her brothers and sisters were quite a, quite a group of characters and uh, well-known in Melrose, like my family. And, um, you know, we just kind of... We went into it, and you know the Friday night quarter beer between us went into well, why don't we just get a case for the five or six of us? And um, I should have known it was first love. I, Jacko says this that uh, you know middle of the winter it's freezing cold and like she'd give me a mitten, right? Yeah. Hold my butt can. She'd have a mitten, I'd have a mitten. It's like, dude, that's love, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny where you think of um, the stuff that's so monumental. Because when you're an addict, you're an alcoholic. For me, I can still remember this first time I started a pill. And that warm feeling. It was it was prescription. I was waking up sick because the prescription wasn't hitting me hard enough. They had me on Oxycontin. And somebody said, if you store it, it'll hit you harder. And after that, I knew. And and then I remember the first time doing heroin. And I remember being like, I want to feel this way from it. And it took all right. my problems away. It also took everything good away. And I mean, if you look where you went, um, you had a, you had a rough ride. You didn't, you know. I always say some people pay a heavy price for this. You did. I mean, you were right. at one point you were into the meth and you were riding with the biker gang. And yeah. I mean, it was yeah. So it was. So I had this beautiful young girl in my life, and I had to follow my brother's footsteps. And why have one when, like everybody, has a couple of girlfriends, or you get rid of this one, you get another one, and, and just no respect because I never was never taught respect. So you know, real quick. It was skipping school every day, seventh grade, eighth grade, part of ninth grade, and, and like it's what my brothers did. My brother got thrown out, and he's not no longer with us. He was like he puts crazy to a, a new level, but um, like I was following his footsteps, and I remember skipping class. I'd be in the school, I'd skip, and I'd be there first thing in the morning, and then I'd disappear. Right? I taught my wife, you just show up a homeroom, and your name's not on the list, then they don't call your house. But, um, you know, I just, I remember walking around the hallways and, and like I had a lot of hair, long hair, leather <laughs> jacket, and, and like I wasn't a tough guy, I never was. But, you know, I wasn't a punk troublemaker. I was a lost kid and, and a little bit of it, I knew it then. But, um, you know, I remember like the guidance counselors, they liked me, the, junior, the middle school principals liked me. And like, what kind of class do you want? I don't, I don't do gym, okay. They put me in a cooking class, right? <laughs> Auto shop. And, and, you know, they would do anything to please me, but I just, like, I didn't know, right? So um, I made it up to high school, and the tough guy principal that, that you know, 
some people like nowadays, you know, he's passed recently, but uh, the guy, he took me by the throat and said, you're not going to be like your brother. And he just slammed me against the wall. And I was terrified, right? And um, I remember getting thrown out of school. I'm walking across, and I have nightmares about this still today, 40 years later, 45, 40 years later. And um, every once in a while, I'm like, wow. And I'm walking across the grass in front of Melrose High School, and there's nothing, no people, no cars, nothing moving. And I'm walking towards the pond, the loneliest person in the world. And that's my nightmare, you know? And if they had ADD and all that stuff back then, they owed me an education, you know? But not, nowadays they do, but back then they just like, get them out of here, you know? It's crazy. Um, and, and you know what's even crazier? Um, I, I know your story, so you remember, Bobby, you and I got into each other's lives in a weird way. I'm friends with your nephew, Billy. My, my best friend in the world was Tommy. I mean, yeah. I, was, I was at Paul Bear at his funeral. We were, we were so close. And these are relatives, and next thing you know, it turns out they both relate to you. And so for right. me, Tommy, like, I get choked up, but Tommy lives on with you guys. Right. Like, I see you and I get Tommy in my life. And uh, that's a tough thing for me, losing him, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, he died like a man. I mean, this guy went out fighting with cancer. I used to tell him, we'd drive to meetings, and he had his throat was, you know, and his throat was, the, the open hole in his neck would smell. And I'd be like, Tommy, open the window, you smell bad. Yeah. It's winter, and I'm like, I don't care, you smell bad. Right. We had such a great bond. And then uh, God put you in my life. And at the hottest time of my life, you would start sending me positive texts. Hey, do this. Hey, be grateful. All stuff I used to do when I was in recovery and strong, but I was in a weak place. And uh, you just jump out of things. You have an energy. So, I mean, your bottom was hard. Right. I mean, if you if you get involved in a biker gang, it's hard to get out. Oh, yeah. You know, like I have yeah. friends that are involved in the other walks of life, and they can't get out, supposedly. Right, right. Um, but you got out, Bobby. And not only you get out, but you lead a lot of guys like myself out of the tunnel. And, right. um, and I know you don't take any credit for it, which is absolutely insane. But I would run into you at the jail when I was volunteering up there. I'd run into you here. And every time I saw you, there was some positive energy. And I'm like, Jesus mm -hmm. Christ, this guy's either on meth now or he's on fire, whatever the hell it is. It's just a passion. For, I'm amazed still to this day, right? You know, when I was with the motorcycle club back then, I was a lot younger than them. So they looked out for me. They'd just give me piles of crystal meth. And we'd stay up seven or eight days in a row. And I was probably 18, 19. I thought that was normal. I thought everybody, I thought my mother did this stuff. Oh, Jesus. And, uh, <coughs> and the president of the, the club lived in this area and uh, he pointed a gun at me. And he said, if I ever catch you with a needle in your arm, I'm gonna fucking kill you. And I'm gonna do it as a favor to your family, right? And I respected that for so long, right? And, and like, I, Maybe he knew that inside I had a hot, like I'd be riding with these guys and if I hit a squirrel, I don't want to go back and check on it, right? <laughs> and like so I could play the tough guy, put the gun in my pocket and all that nonsense. But if I ever had to use it or do something, I would have done it to please the guys in the room standing behind me, not because, you know, you screw up with me, I'm going to kill you. I wasn't like that, Yeah. you know? And I wonder how many people are, how many real tough guys there are out there. But, um, you know, I knew somewhere inside I had a heart, right? And it just got worse and worse. The meth just took, held me by the throat. My brother Jackie would do it all, you know, four, five, six days straight. He'd go to sleep, right? And I'm like, I, I'm obsessed with that stuff. So everything I had, my plans for the club, you know, the, the motorcycle I had went to a, Shitbox stolen Holly because I sold mine to buy the stolen one and it had no numbers on it. It was like my father at the time was a police commissioner in Mald and, and some of the cops would look like Jimmy DiPaolo actually. Yeah. Like, you're fucking crazy. If you get stopped on this bike, not even your father's going to get you out of it. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, and, and again, I wasn't like telling them off or telling them where to go. I just shrugged my shoulders and like, doesn't everybody, yeah. you know, I was taught, and my father was like a character. I brought it to the next level, but my father, you're like, hey, an ain't nailed down, fucking take it. <laughs> right? And like my brother Jackie, same thing. I was sixth grade stealing. He worked for the state where I ended up once I got thrown out of school. But Jack, I was with my brother one day skipping school, and we got a old MDC dump truck, right? He was working. We got like seven or eight picnic tables piled up on the back. Brand new ones, right? And we're dropping them off at people's houses. <laughs> and, and it wasn't to sell. For him, I'm sure it was people pleasing, you know? And that's, 
he had a he did some damage, right? Yeah, well, from but Bobcats, front end loaders, you name it. Crazy. If it wasn't nailed down, it just belongs to us. You know what's funny? You said that about the people pleasing. Um, I look back and all the tough guy things I did, quote unquote. So the Fourth of July, I went to a friend's barbecue. He lives a different life. He's on a different side of the tracks. But I go to his, I go to his Fourth of July fireworks every year, and uh, I'm sure I'm on, I'm on camera somewhere. But uh, <laughs> you know, he's like a brother to me. He always was. When I go there for an hour, and I know I don't belong there, so I don't, I, leave, I don't stay long. But I think back to all the tough guy things I did, and, and I did uh, insecurity trying to impress people. Right. I, I didn't poke people because I was a tough guy. Because tough right. guys would just say, "Hey, if you're tough, you'll fight somebody with your hands, or you'll walk away and say, I don't." Nowadays, right. I say, "I don't need your nonsense." Yeah. But at that point, I did some stupid stuff because I wanted people to respect me. I wanted to be accepted, and and I think that's what le- drugs did for us. Absolutely. I don't know about you, but it made me feel accepted. Yeah, yeah, and it just it goes on whether it's you know if you're in a club. Or like you, you're hanging with the wise guys. You're doing. You got money coming. You got this and that. It's still that it, it's it runs not there. out though. It runs oh, out. Uh, tell me about the, it. Right? Dr- drugs will take everything. I said yeah. one day, drugs don't even take from you. They make you give away what you right. want. And that's the worst part is you're right. handing away. I, I remember at the end, a guy coming in. I gave him for two bags of dope, thirty bucks each. I gave him the TV off my wall, and right. I thought I can't afford Comcast. Anyways, right. take it. And right. that was pathetic. Right. 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 You know, I had sold everything I owned and. So, you know, I think what you were the like, most exciting things is you transformation. What made you change? What was the bottom line? So I lived in a room in Malden, rooming house. I, I, like people coming off the dope now, the heroin and everything, like, oh, I'm kicking. I'm, I got to go. I'm going to leave detox. It, you know, that crystal meth, man, that shit was crazy. And I'd go for seven or eight days. I'd take three or four days to come down. I wouldn't eat anything, right, the whole time. I used to drive around with Carnation Instant Breakfast, right? And I was a genius, I'll tell you, nutritionist. And I look at the side of the box, there's eggs, there's bacon, a picture of bacon <laughs> and eggs on it, right? This is all you need. Oh. And But I'd go back and the paranoia, the shaking, the sweats, the like, the shitting, disgusting, you know? And, and I'd be afraid to live in my little room in Malden where a bunch of people, it was a rooming house, I'd never even heard of recovery. so. I was um, I was living there, and, and it would go on. It felt like it went on for thirty years, but it was only probably only like six years, I think. Only six years. Yeah, that's yeah. a shit ton of tell everybody. And it was like I can like yesterday. Remember my sister stopping by and leaving a, a cookie tin with um, a bunch of penny rolls and pennies in it, and buy a bag of chips and a bottle of ginger ale, and like I wouldn't even answer the door. And I remember her banging on the door one day. Christmas, mom and dad's like, you know, they my mother and father divorced, but we would make the rounds, or whatever. But um, you know, and, and I would I would melt that show up like what a loser. And it was so painful. There was no tough guy in me there, you know. No. I hated it. Like, I feel you like know. a junkie. There's no there's no pride in feeling like a junkie. It's it's probably the worst. I remember looking at my mother's eyes through a glass window with a phone up and thinking to myself, like, I did this to them. Like right. I'm breaking them, I'm killing them. Right. So in fact, somebody said to me, you're my father. Like, my dad's a nice guy. But my dad, they had, they had to sit down once at each mention. And my father, they go around talking. It was when I was in my 20s. I was married for a brief time. And gets to my father. And the guy says, what do you want to see? My father goes, he's not a man. I want him to die. Just die. You know what I mean? Right. He didn't understand recovery. When he started to learn about it, the pain in his eyes, it went from anger to pain. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, breaking your, your loved ones, for me, that's what keeps me sober. I don't want my parents to have to sit there and look at me in a box. Right. right. That and right. my daughters, right. obviously. But I mean, you know, that when there's a bad day, the reason I'm able to pick up the phone now is because I think of the consequences if I don't. Right. Right. Now the game's right. right to me. You, if you do a pill of oxycodone, you're really doing fentanyl. I mean, it's a day for oh, yeah. these people yeah. out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's just we're we're living on borrowed time. You know, play, like one of my Iron Man friends, he said, Yeah, I met him out at Lake Placid. We we're doing a practice swim and I had no idea who he was. Turns out he's in recovery like a year less than me. Oh, that's crazy. And I'm like, wow, because I, I, I said, you know, my life, I'm banged up, man. I, you know, I'm not here to win. And he said, yeah, me neither. I said, I've been through hell and back with, you know, drinking and drugs. And I just get into this stuff, you know, on running a 5K. And the next thing you know, <laughs> so, <Addiction. laughs> so he goes, yeah, he goes, me too. And, he, and he's, he's a very wealthy guy, right? And um, he goes, we're playing with house money, right? He goes, we should be dead. 
It's true. You know, we lived in the streets. We lived in the gutters. We had no value. We had nothing. But let me, let me ask something. You just touched on something. But that most you say it casually as if we all can do this. I can't run a 3K. So when you talk about running a marathon as a, as a training thing, hey, Ryan, I'm going to go run a marathon. I'm, I'm working on my training. I think people who train to run marathons, I go, what a jackass. Because every time you say it, I'm like, what an asshole. Yeah. You'll send me a picture at 6 a.m. You just get out of the pool. And I'm like, I hope he drowns this bastard. Because you do, you do things that you do triathlons consistently. Right. That's a it, sickness, you know. That's not normal. So the recovery part, I got into recovery. I worked, My father got me a job for the sheriff's department. And it ugly, right, when McGonagall was sheriff. City of Malden, painting lines in the street. He was a commissioner. I reported to Jimmy Cohane, who was a drinker, you know, the yeah. chief. I'm out painting lines in the street one night. I made the street behind the old police station. It was always a one-way. And for some reason, I put two lines down the middle of the street. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it into the two way. <laughs> and like, again, he's just like, kid, what are you doing? My father owned a police supply company and we made police badges out of brass, you know, for all over the world. Would have been an unbelievable family business. And, and he said, this is yours. And I'm like, dad, I'm like 19 years old. I, uh, yeah, I don't want the responsibility. Yeah, yeah. And it broke his heart. Like my father was, a, he could drink the beers with the best of them. He was always involved with something very, very big into volunteerism. Would say, I got it from him. They help anyone. And he yeah, always well, said. That's, let's, let's touch on that. Every time that somebody walks into a new guy, I see you go to them and you just, you put your hand around, you bust their cookies. You're like, yeah, we all like this. We're all in it together. And you make it as if you are, I know when you put your hand around me and your arm around me, you said, right, yeah, we're in this together. For that moment, I thought you got sober the same time I did because you made me feel like we're on the same level. And whereas the reality yeah. is, you've been sober what thirty something years? Thirty five. Yeah. Thirty five years. Imagine you were a crystal meth in thirty five fucking years sober. That's impressive. Wasn't easy, man. No, you it's know? never. It's never. Nothing good is. And like, like my father, you know, he said, and he was involved with politics, the president, like he said, the jailhouse or the White House. We helped everybody, you know. And he goes, that fucking mouth. Most of them don't appreciate it, but we help them anyways. So I kind of got that from him, and he said. And when he was dying, the day he was dying, he was up at his house up on a lake up in New Hampshire, this dirt road. And, you know, and I went in to see him and like I knew my side of the street was clean. That's cool. He became my best friend. And That's he used cool. to like, what the fuck is wrong with this kid? <laughs> and it was the drugs. Why can't she just drink? You know, and, oh, people and, say to me all the time, why do you have to do the? Why would you do the opioids? Take right. a soul, just do a little coke and drink like social, yeah. social coke addicts. You yeah. Know? And, and he got me into the. Um, you know, I got sober, I got into running and Special Olympics volunteering for them. Oh, do you really? It was huge, right? And so what, the day he was dying, he's like, you know, we helped a lot of people, right? With a, with a like, daily breather. <laughs> Most of them don't fucking appreciate it, but we helped them anyways, you know? And, and yeah. he never did he or me reach out for the white envelope, yeah. you know? I just gave you five picnic tables for you. <laughs> <That> was, <laughs> yeah. Where, where's my they don't even guy? fit in your yard, but give me, you know. Yeah. No, I, it wasn't that, you know, and, and, and I learned that from him. So that's one of my blessings along the way. And, and he was friends with motorcycle club guys. He would go to court and help them out. And he'd back me up, you know, hey, bring him in here. We got to talk, you know, and, and, and politicians so and LB from the Bruins when he used to get in yeah, trouble. Oh he was like my father's son. And um, so when I got sober, it was the only thing I ever did in my life. I never heard of AA. I, I couldn't spell AA, right? And How did you get so involved then? Because, I mean, you're a big part of the program. Right. 26 years old, I had no idea. I told my father, he goes, don't you think you ought to join the Marines? You know, <laughs> and, and my first thought was, you just want to get me the fuck out of here. Yeah, so I can't too. call you all the time to pay my rent and get my car <laughs> or get me out of jail. So, um my only decision ever was to go in. I was working at GE and some, some guy there, Sully, that he saw me when I was down, I was shaking, I was really struggling, late night shift. And he's like, there's a place you can go, you know, the ranch. The ranch, Cowboys and Indian Ranch. Yeah. And the next thing you know, he makes a call at three in the morning and I'm like, if you're calling someone at 3 a.m., I, I want to meet this guy, right? Yeah. And it was the EAT guy. And um, they, Few hours later, they picked me up. They drove me up to New Hampshire, Seminole Point, up on uh, Lake Sunapee. No idea. It could have been the Harry Christians for all I knew, and I would have. I was just burnt, man. Yeah. I couldn't do it. And I went in, and a couple of things I heard was um, about praying. I'm praying. What are you talking about, right? 
it's a God place. And, and he goes, no, just, and I asked my roommate, they told me to ask for help. He said, yeah, get down on your knees, you know, and I'm like, all right. And then my counselor, who was a very, very well-respected guy who was on the street drinking, and he ended up back before he died, but Dave Bryant from Somerville, he, um, he's just big, jolly guy. He said, Bob, get on your knees. Ask God for a positive attitude and a grateful heart. And, okay, what does grateful mean, right? And it's funny to picture you asking that question because you're probably one of the most gr grateful motherfuckers I know. I've asked <laughs> every single day since then. The first year I bounced in and out, I'd smoke an eight ball of coke and I'd be <sighs> saying my prayers in the morning. I remember doing that. I remember using, yeah. getting, sorting some pills, getting on my knees and asking God for help. God's right. probably looking at me like, hey, pal, you should have asked me before you right. started those pills. But you don't know, you know, when you're in it, it just seems like all you know. Right. And you're doing right. whatever right. you used to do that you think might make you successful because you're desperate. Yeah. And like, I, I was never taught to sit down at a table and eat with a knife and a fork. I was never taught not to take, you know, you're in the 7-Eleven. You just take a candy bar and you eat, eat it when you're in the aisle. That's normal in my, with my brothers. So I don't know. I, that's just what I did. So now I get into that place and, and a positive attitude, grateful heart. And then someone said, stick with the winners. Fuck you talking. <laughs> We're right? all in rehab. There are no President winners. President of the club is the winner to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I got out and I knew one kid that I went to school with, you know, growing up. And he was doing this AA thing. And I called him. And he brought me a couple of meetings, and um, I was every Saturday morning group. I'd go over there, and it was this old man Bill. He used to drive a Corvette, right? White license plate, old man, big white beard, smoking a uh, a pipe, right? Got the scally cap on, and he he drove race cars. He was a wealthy guy. He drove race cars. He skied all over the world, right? Yeah. And knew everybody. Him and Richie Diorio was an iron worker. And I sat with them, and I got them both as my sponsors, and, like, they were the winners. But I wanted, old man Bill had the Corvette. He had all the chicks all over him, right? Yeah. He was married. And, uh, but, I'm like, I, that's the winners, you know. So, and then Richie would say, Bobby, don't even go there. Stay away from these girls, right? And um, right off the bat, within, God, two months, um, one of the old guys, you know, that group there, they, they said, uh, you want to work for the Department of Correction? I'm like, what? <laughs> Got it ironic. Are you crazy? And like, no, right? I had a short stint at the Sheriff's Department that ended very ugly. And um, and like, I don't even know if I, I don't even know what ever happened with that, you know, back in, that was in like 1980. But um, so I'm like, no. And, and the old man Bill's like, just take it. It's a drunk driving jail in Boston. You'll like it. And he's smoking this pipe. And I'm like, all right, I'll set you up. And I went in for an interview and I ended up with the job and like, what the hell is going on? I still got guns at home, man. I'm not, I'm not buying into this shit, you know? And, and like, I still had a criminal mind, but I took the job and I took that stick with the winners with me to work. And for 25, my 25 year unbelievable career. Yeah. I didn't stick with the, the, the screws. They're a colorful bunch. You know that, yeah, right? Yeah, I do. And, <laughs> Both sides of the table. And, <laughs> I've and, worked with them and I've been on the other side. And I remember when I ended up going up to Concord and, and like, I'm looking at them and they're big, heavy guys, all divorced, all, you know, drinkers and stuff. And I'm like, if I ever got these guys on crystal meth, they'd be fucked, right? <laughs> they'd <drop out>, yeah. go <laughs> We'd be working overtime for years at a time straight, you know? And um, so... There was a, a lieutenant from Melrose um, that Marty Dodo, who was a squared away guy, right? And now I'm sober six, seven, eight months. I ran into my high school girlfriend. My wife started going with her. And oh, so you guys had time apart. Oh, yeah. God, yeah, yeah. She good, went good to college her. and I went <laughs> to hell. 